Father God, we thank you for your wisdom and your grace. We thank you for the stories that you give us in Scripture to help us understand more about the way your, you've orchestrated life to work for us. We ask, Father, that you would just still our hearts, still our minds, and help us to receive a word from you this morning, in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that I had battled with when I was invited to be part of the ministry here at Liberty Church, and probably before that as well, as God was opening up these opportunities or these ideas to me, was the idea of being a woman in ministry. There are cultural norms in churches that suggested that this is not appropriate. I've had people tell me they would never come to my church or our church because it's not right to have a woman in leadership. And there were internal conflicts for me that pulled me backwards and forwards. And one of the last conversations that I had with my mum, and I'm very grateful for this, was to acknowledge that and to thank her that I grew up in a home where there was no us and them, that people are given opportunities to minister according to the way God has gifted them, not according to their gender, according to the way God positions them, his grace in that situation. And I said to my mum, I could probably do what I do now because of the example that her and dad did, that they were partners in ministry, different roles look different, not one over the other. And that I was very glad that I was able to verbalise and to make that acknowledgement uh, before she left. And I, I think I acknowledge too that God was setting a stage for me so that I didn't have to unlearn stuff as I step into um, (coughs) ministry. But there's still things, these cultural battles, this cultural opposition was still something that was very real to me. But I kept going back to that idea. If God's called me, then he's not going to disqualify me according to the culture of a church or the culture of a community. And those of you who have journeyed with us during our time here at Liberty Church will know the principles that have come out of Nehemiah that we continually refer to as a point of encouragement. The idea of rebuilding is multidimensional. It's not just about rebuilding a wall. And that's what we've been looking at in this journey with Nehemiah. And there are principles here that can encourage us. It's a bit like a roadmap, aspects of our own mission as we rebuild things in our lives, things that used to be strong but now are not so much. And we started last week by looking at where the account of Nehemiah fits into the story of the Israelites, the big brushstrokes. And like a wall, we build up the picture of context to have some idea how all this fits together. Nehemiah's story does not happen in isolation. Nehemiah led the third wave of the Jews returning to Jerusalem after the city had fallen to the Babylonian conquest under Nebuchadnezzar. So Nehemiah's account since chronologically after the book of Esther and the book of Ezra in the Old Testament. And in the time of Nehemiah, the reigning world power is the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And the king at that time was Artaxerxes. And we talked about the idea that Nehemiah was the cupbearer 
to the king. And we spoke how he was praying favour in his audience with the king. So let's read how that went. Nehemiah chapter 2, and we're going to read the first eight verses. So, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the cities where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, what is it you want? Then I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in his sight, let, me send, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. Then the king with the queen sitting beside him asked me, how long will your journey take? And when will you get back? It pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. And I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans-Euphrates so that they will provide me with safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And may I have a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel by the temple and for the city wall and for the residence I will occupy. And because of the gracious hand of my God was on me, the king granted my request. So for four months since Nehemiah heard the report from Jerusalem, he has been fasting and praying along with others in the Jewish community. And we saw that last week we had a journal of his prayer and part of that was for favour with the king. His role of cupbearer was a trusted role, like the head of security. But Nehemiah also had other obligations like always be happy, upbeat, positive, pleasant. But now, now Nehemiah allows the truth to leak out. And I've always wondered if this was an intentional disclosure to allow the king to see his heart or whether he just could no longer hold it in anymore. This was a huge risk. He felt afraid for his life. But again, drenched in prayer, he dives in. And he tells the king what was on his heart to accomplish. Did you notice that Nehemiah had done his homework? He had worked a plan. He knew what was needed to move forward on this. When the king asked what he wanted, he was able to specifically respond, time frames, building materials, and he asked for letters of authorization, especially for the governors of the trans-Euphrates. These were the rulers who had opposed the work previously, which we read about in Ezra last week. They had put a stop to the work. So it was important that Nehemiah had a letter to address those people that this had the authority, the king's seal on this project. And he gives God all the credit. Because the gracious hand of God was on me, the king commissions Nehemiah to be governor of Jerusalem to go and accomplish this work. But... Nehemiah acknowledges it's not because Nehemiah was remarkable, but because God is remarkable. The gracious hand of God was on him. So let's read from verse 9 the rest of this passage. 
So I went to the governors of the trans-Euphrates and gave them the king's letters, and the king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. When Sanballat the Honorite and Tobiah the Ammonite and the official heard about this, they were very much disturbed by that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. I went to Jerusalem and after staying there three days, I set out during the night with a few others. I had not told anyone what my God had put on my heart to do for Jerusalem. There were no mounts with me except the one I was riding on. By night, I went through the valley gate towards the jackal well and the dung gate, examining the walls of Jerusalem, which had been broken down, and its gates, which had been destroyed by fire. And I moved on towards the fountain gate and the king's pool, but there was not enough room for my mount to get through. So I went up to the valley by night examining the wall and finally I turned back and re-entered through the valley gate. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing because as yet I had said nothing to the Jews or the priests or the nobles or the officials or any others who would be doing the work. And I said to them, you see the trouble that we are in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned with fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. I also told them about the gracious hand of God on me and what the king had said to me. They replied, let us start rebuilding. Let us start rebuilding. So they began this good work. What I admire about Nehemiah is his systematic approach. He doesn't dive in with emotional speeches for action. He rides the full perimeter of the wall, at least where he can access it. He is not an armchair warrior. He gets on the ground. He walks through the rubble. He assesses the situation carefully. He does a full audit of the conditions. He sees the problems. He explores the gaps. He goes in with his eyes wide open. His courage is not intimidated by what he discovers. His motivation does not wane because it seems too big or too overwhelming. He is not a man who has a grasshopper mentality. He is looking at the giants and he says, our God is bigger. And then he talks out the vision. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and we will no longer be in disgrace. We are in this together. Come, let us. Not you doing all the work not us against them, not power over, but we are all in this together. Come, let us do this good work. We have a common goal to rebuild the walls. You can see the extent of the problem. You know what has happened. Let us focus on the work. Let us focus our energy towards this. And we have a united purpose we will no longer be in disgrace. This is not just about the wall. It's about all of the vision and the plans and the purposes God had instilled in his people when he appointed Jerusalem as their capital. It was a disgrace. They were in disgrace. And this was a pathway through that humbling, no longer a place of disgrace, but moving forward in God's grace. Then Nehemiah reinforced how God's gracious hand has been all over this. This is not just about national pride, not just about cultural reinstatement. This is about all the relationship that these people had with their God. And then it tells us that the good work began. And then, in the very next verse, something happens, not unexpected, but very significant. 
And we read in verses 19 and 20. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this you are doing, they asked. Why are you rebelling against the king? And I answered them by saying, the God of heaven will give us success. We are his servants. We will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. The very next thing that Nehemiah has to deal with in this road map for rebuilding was overcoming opposition. Just because God was in this, just because he had a plan, just because he had the king's authorization, it did not mean that this exercise was going to go unchallenged. And this opposition does not come from just one quarter. It does not come in a choreographed sequence like a Jackie Chan movie where the hero can deal with one villain at a time. It comes all at once from different directions. There is Sanballat, the Horonite, who had a Moabite heritage, but who at this time holds significant influence and command in Samaria. There is Tobiah from Emmon and Geshem from Arab, the Arab. This is a three-pronged attack. And as I look at the map of the area, it gives me a genuine sense that opposition is the thing that is going to make this project fall over, if anything will. This is coming from all directions. Perhaps another way of looking at this is to consider where our opposition comes from. And rather than giving it an all-encompassing Satan is against me, there are other elements that are at play here. Yes, there is opposition from the spiritual realm. Sam Ballot's name means hatred in secret. A spiritual assignment is often done in secret. A cult means obscured, covered in secret. Ephesians 6 tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. This is a real agenda against the work of the kingdom. Then there's also the opposition that comes from within ourselves. Tobias' agenda was driven by his selfish promotion. He has no self-regulation or control. He rages, he is manipulative, he is powerful, he is self-seeking. He represents the opposition of the flesh. And in Romans 8, we have a strong description of what that looks like when compared to those who are living according to the Spirit of God. Romans 8, it says those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, the mind governed by the Spirit is is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. The flesh describes our slavery to sin that dictates that we live according to what is in direct opposition to God. And it will come up against us when we choose to move away from that and into a life governed by the Spirit of God, accomplishing the work that the Spirit desires. Then there's also the opposition that is directed from the world. 
And this is represented by Geshem the Arab. Geshem's name means having material substance. Sometimes what appears to be common to the culture of our community or for the common good that would set itself up against the things of God and the things of his kingdom. And in James, he writes this, you adulterous people, you don't know that friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. These things are in conflict. There will be opposition that will come up against it when we're rebuilding things in our lives that are of the Spirit of God. So these are the elements of opposition that Nehemiah battled against. They are also what we battle against. It's not just a spiritual battle, although it is definitely that. It is also a battle against the things that drive within us, selfish independence that finds God's way hard and tiresome and difficult. It's also the pull of the world, the corporate voice that stands up and says in alliance against God, against his values, against his kingdom. And if we look through all of the account provided by Nehemiah, and particularly in chapter 4, and I do encourage you to read through it again, Nehemiah goes into some detail about what this opposition looked like for the people. We see things that are coming in from outside, the Sanballats and the Geshems, who oppose what Nehemiah is wanting to achieve. There is blatant ridicule, mockers who would scorn and deride what is happening. There is intimidation, bullying and threats of harm. There is unleashed anger, being constantly exposed to people's unrestrained rage. That takes its toll. There is false accusations, fabrications and slander against his character. And there's also a conspiracy to mobilise war, a coalition in these regions to fight against Nehemiah and to prevent the re-establishment of Jerusalem. But what I notice as I'm reading through these things is that the impact of this opposition from outside escalates and becomes a bigger problem. We start to see things that are causing problems from inside. The internal problems start to emerge. The problems from within, within us. There is overwhelm by the job. There is so much work, so little resources, so little people or time, so that we don't even know what to do next. There is emerging discouragement. It's hard, it's long, it's impossible, it's dangerous. There are emerging selfish agendas, people pushing their own positions. There's an upsurge in greed, people taking advantage of others' vulnerabilities to push their own well-being. And then there's also an experience of internal treachery, people on the inside turning against one another. Those who had been working together and working with each other are now being treated like the enemy and they're turning against each other. This is the opposition that needed to be managed by Nehemiah. So let's read what happens in chapter 4. From verse 7 it says, When Sanballat, Tobiah and the Arabs, when they heard the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the labourers is given out. 
And there's so much rubble, we, we cannot rebuild the wall. And also, our enemies said, before they even know it, or before they see us, we'll be right there among them and we will kill them and we'll put an end to the work. And then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that they were aware, that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work and the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armour. The officers posted themselves behind all of the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. Part of me resists looking at the opposition that Nehemiah, Nehemiah faced, listing it all out. It's so negative and it does seem overwhelming. It's multifaceted. It is this three-pronged attack. How could they possibly prevail? And yet another part of me wants to stand up and cheer. Yay! Because we do have a story of how, in spite of all of this, Nehemiah did prevail. And this is the strength and the beauty of this story. Yes, it is important to assess the situation and be aware. Nehemiah was never an ostrich. He faced things with wide open eyes. But it is even more important to acknowledge how he kept going in the face of these physical threats of open warfare, in spite of how he kept going with all of these internal oppositions as well. And he kept coming back to the faithfulness of God. Remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. Remember. Remember God's history with us and his people. Remember that we are part of that story. One of the very first strong declarations Nehemiah made was to acknowledge the validity and the authority that he had in his mission. This was not just letters from the king. This was a divine mandate. He said, As for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right to it. That was the foundation that he was building and moving on from. You have no share in Jerusalem, any claim or any historical right to it. We are here under the authority and the stamp of God. We have every right, spiritually, politically, historically, to pursue this course. And if that was in any doubt, then the courage and the strength and the persistence that he was driving to motivate within the people, that would not have been sufficient and the work would have crumbled. The other thing I realise is that Nehemiah had the audacity to fight. He had the audacity to keep going. This is not a fight that they engaged in alone. God's faithfulness is sure. God is the great and awesome one. God is true. God is sure. God is powerful. God keeps his covenant of love. He is faithful to fight for his people. God would not commission them and then abandon them. That is not the nature of God. So they hear the threat, they acknowledge it, and they keep going, being prepared to fight 
for what God had laid on their heart. And Nehemiah is not only mobilising a workforce, he mobilises an army. An army that is not in rebellion against the king of the Medes and the Persians, but against those who would come to frustrate and oppose the work authorised by that very same king. And I love the imagery, the imagery of the workers having someone standing at their back, the lookouts who are vigilant, checking for threats, ready to fight for their own. And I also love the idea that each family had responsibility for their own section of work with the tools of their trade. But they also had a responsibility to defend their families and their city and they held a weapon in their other hand to defend that territory. They did both. The work and the defending, holding the weapons in their hand. So as we ask some questions around this story, let's try and bring this back to where we are with our relationship with God. Do I come to a project with a clear assessment of what is needed? Where have I identified gaps that need attention? How does this story make me more aware of the experiences of opposition in my life? What, op what opposition do I experience that is a spiritual one? What opposition is cultural? What opposition is an internal one? Internal, part of the way I approach life. Have I taken responsibility to rebuild or have I become overwhelmed by the immensity of the task? What threats do I need to acknowledge? Are they outside threats or are they inside threats? Is my role to work and build or to defend or to do both? Build with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. How can I use the example of Nehemiah to defend situations that are important to me? Do I remind myself of God's faithfulness? What declaration can I make that we have a divine mandate to build God's kingdom? Do I have the audacity to keep fighting? Am I always vigilant? Where is the invitation that this story offers me as I think about rebuilding in this year? I've, I've given an example of um, cultural opposition. Um, I've spoken to you a number of times about the internal opposition that I face. So I wanted to include or even conclude with an example of spiritual opposition. This is real. This can happen. And I remember it was about the first anniversary when we'd been here about 12 months. Uh, something happened at home. I think it was an argument about the kids always stealing my phone charger. Something really important. But we know that it's never about the thing. It's the accumulation of stuff that happens. Anyway, I went off. I had this massive meltdown. I sat in the chair in the lounge room and I can remember feeling completely overwhelmed by not home but the church and this mission I just thought, I am not up for this. I'm done. I'm out. I am going to contact um, the person who looks after the churches. 
tomorrow morning, first thing, and hand in my resignation, let them know I'll be in caretaker mode, they can find someone else to do this, I'm done. And in that moment, that seemed the most logical, sensible thing I could do. And then I thought, hang on a minute, where's that coming from? I know God's called me to be here. I know this is what he wants me to do. But in the darkness of this moment, none of that seemed to matter. But, and this oppression, it was a physical oppression that I could feel. I cannot do this. So I did what Nehemiah did. I acknowledged it. I called it out. I rebuked it and said, that is enough. I'm here because God's called me to be here and I will stay until he says I'm done. Not you, not me. That is the decider. I'm here until God tells me otherwise. And what I noticed was it left. Straight away it left and it lifted that tells me that was in a spiritual oppression. It was a spiritual opposition. He didn't want me here. He didn't want the walls to be rebuilt. So I bring that story as an encouragement. We have the authority in Christ. He is our great and remarkable God, remember the Lord, just like Nehemiah starts the work, he mobilizes a, a workforce, but there is opposition to this project that is real and it is unnerving and it is intimidating. And yet he keeps drawing the people back to the faithfulness of God and they push through. They keep going and they do it with their eyes wide open. They do it with tools in their hands. They are tired, they do get dirty, but they keep going and they do the work with a sword strapped to their side. They were vigilant against the opposition that would come against them. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you are so faithful. I thank you that you are the great and awesome one. I thank you that we can stand here and remember the Lord. We can remember who you are. We can remember that you are great and that you do call your people to various things, whether it's in our home, whether it's in our business, whether it's in our community, whether it's in our church. Father, I thank you that you are not a God who would call us to do a task and then not resource us. Father, that you do resource us to be able to deal with opposition, that you do equip us to be able to be audacious enough to fight for what you have called us to do. And we thank you for that. We thank you so much for that. We ask your blessing over all of the people here that would call Liberty Church their home. Father, we ask your blessing over them. We ask your blessing over the projects that you have positioned them to do as part of their work in the kingdom of God. And we ask, Father, that you would encourage their hearts. Father, I pray that you would give them courage and the audacity to keep going until it is complete. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your love and your care. We love you and we honour you. In Jesus' name, amen.